fine with everyone. So Elena, just go ahead. The floor is yours. Sound. <laughs> um, hello, everyone. Um, it's a great pleasure and actually an honor to speak to all of you because uh, you're like all the minds that uh, think about so closely about the planning question as well. Um, and yes, and I've come uh, to the planning question more from the degrowth angle and from from <clears throat> yeah from looking at degrowth and postgrowth um, economics uh, around ideas of transformation. And I'll go into some of the details. Um, uh, we also shared uh, Sophie shared the the paper with you um, beforehand, and so and so yeah. I'm, so my background is not in planning, <laughs> um, but more like seeing that actually planning is an important issue to achieve certain things that have been discussed in the degrowth and post-growth realm. Um, and so, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to also get your feedback uh, on the ideas that we put together in this paper. Um, so yeah, what I'll, I'm, yeah, maybe just briefly about my person. I, well, I did my PhD in economics on post-growth, kind of a critical analysis of post-growth economic policies um, from a political economy, macroeconomic perspective. And I'm now working at the University of Lausanne as a uh, postdoc, um, partly on the, yeah, it's connected to the real project uh, for post-growth deal, um, a European-wide project that looks into the politics and policies um, of, um, yeah, of post-growth. Um, and then I have a little, small uh, yeah, a project on the side. Uh, which looks more at the macro financial dimensions uh, of degrowth and their uh, planning is is one part, but then also questions around monetary reform, macro uh, macro fiscal coordination. Um, but yeah, so the planning already. Um, uh, search for I'm hopefully soon. Uh, okay, I'm just okay. I will just to, to say beforehand, I will ignore the chat because it, it's I'm not I'm so bad at multitasking, so I'll focus on. Um, yeah, the um, or maybe later in the in the um, maybe later in the Q and A, uh, I'll be better able to accommodate <laughs> what's happening in the question uh, in the chat. Uh, but anyway, so I am yeah. So that's a bit of my background. Uh, so yeah, I'm now at working on this macro finance uh, uh, and degrowth. Uh, and, and yeah, and this pay today, what I'll present kind of is uh, we sent around the paper together with Cédric Durand and Mathias Schmelzer and, um, and beforehand, but then I've also published with uh, Mathias uh, in monthly review an article. We have, the three of us have put together uh, a chapter for a forthcoming book uh, on planning, uh, um, yeah, the edited volume by Jan Gross and um, uh, oh, sorry. Oh, this is <laughs> so sorry. Embarrassing. Christoph Sorg. Uh, sorry, we just met just a week ago. It's like horrible. Um, yes, and and then so also just like translating uh, this 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 research uh, into yeah, doing some uh, translation work into other communities. But so kind of that's uh, so the presentation draws on different uh, pieces of work, and I start uh, with my um presentation oh no i need to start sharing first um where is it um just a second And I'll go to full screen. Yes, so planning beyond growth, uh, the case for economic democracy within ecological limits. As I said, it's a work uh, that is uh, that I've done together with uh, Cédric Durand and Mathias Schmerzer. Um, and so maybe first uh, the question, uh, why planning beyond growth? And I hope I'm not boring you with this, but uh, in different talks, I thought like it's always kind of important to kind of lay the basis and really look again at where we're at in terms of the social ecological crisis, just because this is for us uh, the starting point, um, the starting point for the investigation. And I thought like, yeah, as it's specifically about the ecological and connected um, environment, um, social questions, I'll just 
uh, share with you a few graphs. And that also already gives us a taste in terms of what we need to consider when we think about planning beyond growth. And so the first, um, the first slide here is the, uh, the the this one slide that maybe many of you already know. It's a transgression of planetary boundaries. So that concept of planetary boundaries that visualizes um, that it's not only that the ecological crisis that we're currently facing, it's not only about climate change, that is one uh, that we talk about a lot, but that it is also about different uh, areas and kind of these planetary boundaries, they conceptualize different dimensions of what is needed for a stable Earth system. And so as we see like here, for example, with biochemical flows, or land use in terms of land system change, biosphere integrity, we're also like overshooting these boundaries. And when we think of planning beyond growth, which is basically planning, um, uh, yeah, planning for 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 preventing ecological crisis, we need to take into account the multi the multi dimension uh, multi dimensionality of the ecological crisis. Um, so having these different dimensions here is is important. And then just uh, historically, I would like to point out different, um, yeah, so kind of when we see the Industrial Revolution roughly uh, in the, well, in the 19th century and how it actually kicked off when we see here in terms of sectors. I mean, now on the ecological dimensions, I'm focusing on CO2 emissions, um, but um, but yeah, I, uh, that, uh, yeah, but I do not forget the different dimensions, but just like here, the connection between coal exploitation, oil exploitation, gas exploitation, uh, and then also the, the, the rise of cement and how that has been linked um, to CO2 emissions. Um, and when we look at uh, not only the kind of the, the kind of the environmental aspect in the abstract, but also how it is connected um, to global distribution or in general, uh, quite in general questions of distribution. We see that again, starting in 1850, um, how, uh, yeah, how the distribution of CO2 emissions has been between regions. And we see kind of what has been conceptualized as historical debt, uh, where the United States, Europe have contributed uh, tremendously to global CO2 emissions. And so that also we need to take uh, into account and how it well so not only the connection to economic growth to industrial uh, processes but also to to what underlies uh, the geographical and power structure um, uh, of these patterns and when we look at uh, the distributions today it is quite striking i find this graph uh, or yeah this illustration um, yeah, quite illustrating because we, on the right hand side, we have the remaining carbon budget for two degrees uh, and then the little one in the middle, the remaining carbon budget for 1.5 degrees. Um, and then we see actually in terms of historical emissions, how that compares to what North America or Europe uh, or China, well, other regions, how that um, how that compares to their historical emissions. And so we actually um, see um yeah what actually what has been emitted what we still as a global community if you want to see it that way can still safely emit um yeah and where the responsibility lies because that is kind of the the argument for degrowth or one of the arguments uh underlying degrowth that it's actually uh, up to or like not only but also yeah strongly up to the global north uh countries in the global north but also corporations uh, that are based in the global north uh, to to take on the main responsibility or to to take on yeah and therefore create these structural changes that degrowth um then um then envisions and this is again like broken down uh into emissions per emitter groups where we see that it's also uh emissions are strongly connected uh to 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 wealth to income um, yeah, where we see that the top 10% account for about 50, a bit less than 50% of, uh, uh, of total emissions on a, on a world scale. So really these kind of past and present inequalities feed into the idea, um, and the idea and ambition of degrowth. And here it's again, uh, we look at the connection between per capita income and CO2 emissions, and we see this upward sloping curve. Uh, uh, yeah, and so we're moving closer to the question of uh, economic growth, industrial um, development, because that upward sloping curve shows that there is a strong connection, again, between per capita income in a country and per capita um, emissions and here we don't even look yeah we don't look into the within country inequalities but this upward sloping curve um, shows us and then the yeah shows us this trend 
uh, these connections. And then we see that the, the green and yellow, it's kind of uh, the Americas and uh, Europe uh, and Russia. So more on the, on the right-hand side where we see, yeah, higher emissions and higher per capita income. And now, uh, yeah, one central aspect of degrowth, even if it's not uh, the only one, is really that question of decoupling. Uh, because the, the basic assumption of green growth uh, scenarios is uh, that there is a decoupling between uh, environmental impact or environmental resource use. So there's different um, ways to conceptualize decoupling, be it on, uh, yeah, on impact or on, or on use. Um, but we see what we see here in, on a global scale um, is that actually global GDP and global material footprint are very strongly uh, correlated and we don't see uh, decoupling trends here. And then with global CO2 emissions, we see um, some, some decoupling, but by no, yeah, by no means like fast and sufficient uh, enough decoupling. And this is actually where politically it becomes really important to think about um, yeah, what, what we want to achieve. And so first, um, I'm citing here uh, Hickel and Kallis, who are also uh, two professors on, on, on our project and who are two people like very, yeah, kind of degrowth proponents who in a review study from 2019 um, observe that there is no empirical uh, evidence that absolute decoupling from resource use can be achieved on a global scale against the background of continued economic growth. And that absolute decoupling from carbon emissions is highly unlikely to be achieved at a rate uh, fast enough to prevent global warming over 1.5 or 2 degrees, even under optimistic policy. Uh, and I can't see the last bit because I saw you policy conditions. Um, and then when that um, when we translate this into kind of like the the decoupling rates or the meaning like the the intensity of um, of the the carbon intensity um, of output at the speed at which it needs to um, reduce Jackson and Victor are also two uh, um, yeah two professors working on post growth uh, economics. Uh, they find that at the global level, suffic sufficient absolute decoupling to prevent climate breakdown would require an average uh, annual decline in the carbon intensity of global economic output of around 14 every year for the next three decades. And what we see right now is that the average rate of decline across the world at the moment is less than 1%. One, uh, 1%. And so we really see that we're kind of far off, uh, yeah, far off track in terms of the technological development, but also the reductions uh, here again, uh, CO2. So probably many of you have seen uh, this or other graphs where we see kind of the 1.5 scenario. Um, yeah, much, uh, yeah, a, a great gap. Uh, what UNEP, uh, the United Nations uh, Environmental Program calls the emissions gap. Um, yeah, that then the conceptualization, conceptualization of where we would need to be for 1.5 degrees and what is kind of the projected in current policy scenarios. And then again, um, Jason Hickel and Yefim Fogel, they uh, add considerations of speed and justice again in this decoupling question. Um, because right now we have seen in certain countries, um, yeah, in certain countries there have been observations of decoupling, of even of absolute decoupling um, of CO2 emissions and, and, and growth. And then there is this, yeah, and now the question is, oh, is this actually um, technological change? Uh, have you underestimated what is actually possible? Um, and so, um, yeah, and then when what they do is then actually look at not only um, of whether absolute decoupling is happening or not, but also how fast uh, it, it happens. And if it's in line with what they call like fair shares, which they conceptualize as um, yeah, a fair share according to according to population of a certain uh, country. And so what they conclude then is that on average, and here they look at the 2013 to 19 period, um, decoupling achievements in the 11 high income countries delivered mitigation rates of 1.6% uh, per year. By contrast, the fair share emissions pathways would on average require mitigation rates of 30 per year by 2025 and 38 per year by 2030. On average, the 11 countries would need to accelerate their decoupling rates by a factor of 10 by 2025 and by a factor of 12 by 2030. And so it's really, uh, yeah, this kind of decoupling uh, is really a doubtful um, 
assumption uh yeah and which is kind of why then degrowth comes in and says hey it's actually uh when it's so hard to decouple and when growth is uh yeah su such a big factor why continue to focus on it and why not uh yeah think of how to decrease this growth dependence um and try to to create indep yeah growth independence um of um, of economies and so here is this comes from my PhD because um, yeah where I kind of tried to conceptualize what it is also in capitalism um, that that really what are the dynamics the underlying social relations that really push uh, for environmental degradation and then also undermine these technological these kind of the yeah the kind of positive te technology scenarios and this is basically um well i mean the the the, the main goal the driving force is really a, it's a system of profit of profit maximization and the priority is not need satisfaction for all within planetary boundaries and then i'm now jumping when we now think of uh, the again the question of technological change then we see even if we see rising labor productivity even if we see um uh, emission uh, efficiency increases, then with this continuous push uh, for economic growth, pushed again by the by the by the aim to by the aim to make profit, then kind of counteracts uh, these these gains that can be made. And this has been conceptualized as rebound effects. Um, and yeah, various rebound effects. Um, well, first, economic growth on the absolute, the push, the systemic push for, for growth, um, undermining efficiency gains, but then also, yeah, absolute growth um, outweigh, uh, outweigh, outweighs these efficiency gains. And then we've got these um, rebound effects at different levels, um, actually, um, yeah, undermining what can be done with uh, technological achievements. And then also in general, we've got like certain institutions such as uh, the dependence on wage labor, uh, the competition of the market that actually locks agents into certain degrading activities. So for example, when we think of wage uh, wage labor, people needing to work for a wage um, to, to satisfy their basic needs and not being able to say, oh no, actually that job uh, is neither good for the environment nor for me, I'll just do something else. And so this pressure, um, yeah, kind of uh, is one force on the on the level of workers, of people. Um, and then when we think about commodification, that the fact um, that it's through commodity production that uh, profit can be made, it's really the commodification of ever, ever more spheres um, of life. Um, and that creates, again, other dependencies of how to access have access to these gains and so within the capitalist system there are these kind of uh dynamics the the social relations that keep um yeah that that undermine this or underpin um this this um this drive for economic growth and so on this basis and i've now kind of like uh um paved the ground to to uh, to our mo motivation to therefore go into the ecological planning debate is really that we see the social ecological crisis that is really, uh, yeah, just, uh, no, it's not at our doorstep, it's actually there, um, really warrants a reorientation of the economy towards universal need satisfaction within planetary boundaries. And that, um, yeah, and that requires systemic shifts in, in our economies. Um, right now, we see analytical and political failure of mainstream economics, and we see post-growth economics as, a, as an emerging paradigm that criticizes the hegemony of economic growth, the primacy of economic growth as policy goals, um, and as I said, um, targets countries in the global north due to inequities and injustices. And so, um, yeah, the, the, the vision um, of economic growth, and that is sometimes uh, explicit, sometimes implicit, is, uh, yeah, that, that, but in any way, in any case, it involves, uh, uh, I'm quoting Jason Hickley here, a planned reduction of energy and resource use to bring the economy back into balance with the living world in a way that reduces inequality and improves human well-being. And so what we have come, yeah, what we were stumbling over was that there is this kind of assumption um, of shifting away uh, from economic growth, uh, environmental destruction in a planned uh, manner. But when we look at the literature, um, we don't really find an engagement with the question of planning and a macroeconomic um, 
level that goes spells really spells out how this could look like uh, this this planned transformation. Um, and so the research questions that we therefore pursue was why is there a lack of engagement with planning and post growth economics. Uh, second, what are the normative basic parameters of planning beyond growth? And then what kind of institutional design could be envisioned uh, for, for uh, planning beyond growth? And so these are the three parts uh, that I'll continue um, yeah, presenting and that uh, are also being discussed in greater depth in, the, in our paper. I'll just take a sip of water. Okay. So why is planning neglected in post-growth debates? Um, what we saw um, is useful to really look at the different strands um, in post-growth economics. Post-growth economics is not really one um, unified body, but has like different strands that also have different theoretical underpinnings, uh, different methodological approaches. And then we thought that actually these um, theoretical methodolo methodological uh, differences uh, kind of can explain or like offer different reasons for why these different schools of thought um, have not necessarily engaged with the question of planning. And so the first uh, would be steady state economics. Um, Herman Daly is the most popular proponent uh, of this trend. Um, and I'm citing from his work because it's kind of like the major the major assumption is that the so-called economic growth already has become uneconomic. The quantitative expansion of the economic subsystem increases environmental and social costs faster than production benefits, making us poor and not richer, at least in high consumption countries. And so the yeah, so the it really focuses on like uh, three macro targets, like three major goals, which is to achieve a sustainable scale. That means to set um, a maximum size of the economy that is deemed sustainable, to have a just uh, tr uh, just distribution and efficient allocation. And um, yeah, and so by just um, so exactly, so the maximum size of the economy that relates to throughput, but also. Um, to population, to hold it constant at a level that is deemed sufficient, to redistribute income and wealth, and then to have market allocation of the goods within those uh, set limits. And so what is interesting is a uh, steady state economics criticizes neoclassical economics, um, but then also it's not fully departing from it in theoretical terms because uh, yeah, it kind of clings on to some of the some of the basic institutions that uh, that that form form part, <clears throat> um, yeah, concepts and uh, and institutions that form part um, of, the, of that body of thinking, and it's reflected uh, in in the yeah in the market allocation and the commitment to remain within the um, boundaries of the system, and then also I'm quoting again to think of like um, uh, to think of di distributist uh, policies that they can be based on impeccably respectable um, premises that is private property. The free market uh, opposition to welfare bu bureaucracies and centralized control, and even if um, so, basically, uh, um, yes. Yeah, so, for example, uh, Daly acknowledges that uh, there needs to be debate in terms of what, uh, yeah, around uh, sustainable scale, and there needs to be uh, deliberation. But then, ultimately, um, ultimately, there, yeah, the 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 market is kind of maintained as a as an efficient. Uh, mechanism and even uh, that is interesting is that it's extended to some areas that uh, have not uh, before been governed by by uh, by prices and markets and that includes um, institutions such as natural resources uh, and population and especially with the latter it also raises um, ethical concerns. And so what we argue is that, um, yeah, that is kind of the framework disregards the role of capitalist institutions in like the systemic drive uh, for expansion, and then also uh, prevents us from really going deeper in, in terms of thinking about the mechanisms of macroeconomic um, coordination. The second strand would be the new economics of prosperity. It focuses on the possibilities of maintaining macroeconomic stability in view of constant or declining um, growth rates uh, in terms of GDP. 
And here, Peter Victor, who I quoted before, or Tim Jackson, um, are really um, yeah important uh, representatives of of this uh, strand. And here, like yeah, the econo ecology economics um, focus it or the the. Um, uh, the new economics for prosperity fo uses a lot of like the um, ecological macroeconomics models to assess the feasibility um, of stable post-growth trajectories. It's mainly grounded um, in post-Keynesian theory connected to ecological economics uh, approaches. And it's about, yeah, how to manage really these macro uh, macro parameters uh, in view um, of, of an ecological constraint, of an ecological target that we would want to achieve. Um, and so in, in these modeling frameworks, um, what is, well, it's really uh, where they're useful is really to see that through changing certain parameters, so, uh, through changing certain assumptions, we can have these uh, sta relatively stable degrowth or post-growth paths, so did, um, reductions in GDP, reductions in CO2 emissions and inequality without major crashes. But then what is interesting is that uh, the assumption that these parameters will be valid in the future uh, is kind of problematic when we think about post growth in in terms of a yeah in terms of a systemic transformation process and so when the purpose of the model is to describe and test a very different system the it's it's less feasible to um, assess the qualitative institutional changes um, such as uh, non capitalist macroeconomic coordination or or planning um, and this quote uh, is from Lange's uh, PhD. He he did a, a review of different economic theories, um, looking into and, and their implications. What 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 they yeah what that would mean for moving beyond growth or for achieving a zero growth economy. And there he quotes that switching from a market to a planned economy represents an entire shift of the economic system instead of changing selected macroeconomic conditions. And the consequence is that most aspects of the macroeconomic theories applied in this work become obsolete. And for him, this is a reason for not looking in deeper into planning, just because it's a different system. And so kind of the same logic, we would argue, applies also to, to this uh, strand um, within uh, within post-growth economics, so that alternative modes of economic coordination um, that are able to integrate the ecological constraints from the uh, onset are not really uh, considered. And in combination to that um, is also that uh, kind of the underlying um, social relations that really um, yeah, characterize capitalist economies um, are, are underestimated or are overlooked. So depending on the model, uh, yeah, for example, class divisions are, are taken into account um, in others, not at all. And we argue that's really, this is a key point uh, in terms of, yeah, moving to, uh, moving to other ways of conceptualizing the macroeconomy. And then the anthropological critiques um, of economic growth, um, here it uh, com comes a bit from a different angle, uh, looking at development connected to economic growth as a Western belief, um, and therefore uh, put the focus on the decolonization of the mind, um, of um, yeah, of really thinking differently about growth uh, and development, um, and argue that it is in our self-interest as well as the global interest to promote cultural diversity, as it may be the key for survival of the human species. And so, um, so they favor immediate human relations just because they look at uh, yeah the alienating processes. Um, that arise from, from markets that substitute impersonal relationships uh, mediated by goods and services for the personal relationships of reciprocity um, and the like. And so economic growth, but also the increasing sophistication of technologies, modern institutions um, and consumerism um, are detrimental to that, uh, to, to, to creating these other types of relation uh, of relationships. And so the focus of that strand is then on the promotion of uh, voluntary simplicity to call it to to foster the quality of life uh, and solidarity. And it's not that um, uh, so that we we do not appreciate uh, the importance of recreating uh, yeah, uh, recreating relationships to each other, uh, recreating relationships between humans and nature, 
um or yeah human and non-human nature but that there are risks uh with a focus uh, of this trend because uh, localism means scaling down the division of labor and what we might uh, just neglect through this lens is the risk that an abrupt disruption of the interdependencies give that are given in a capitalist economy translates into a mass specialization of productive activities a uh, very fast uh, reduction in the productivity of labor and also and then yeah the outcome being an unsustainable reduction of living standards which we do not want as part uh, of a transformation process and again here the the power of capitalist institutions that keep people dependent um and locked into the system um and are not uh, easily changeable through the local recreation uh, of different kinds of uh, of different bonds um, uh, through local initiatives, that is something that might be, yeah, underestimated in that strand. Um, and so, yeah, so we look at these D three strands, then we also, um, if you had had a chance to look at the paper, uh, we identify that like uh, recently there has been an emerging debate uh, inspired by eco-socialist uh, thinking on the question of planning. Um, and so there is, uh, yeah, some... Uh, something bubbling, but it's not that, uh, so maybe there is a greater recognition by some post-growth economic scholars that planning is needed. We don't uh, see that greater, um, yeah, don't see it spelled out in maybe in greater detail. And so what we do is, uh, yeah, to reflect uh, on, on the concepts that we can build on uh, uh, in terms of, yeah, thinking about how to plan uh, for degrowth. Um, and here, or oh, sorry, this text has gotten really small um, somehow. I hope you can still read it. Um, but what we look at is, uh, this is the donut, probably also uh, known to many of you. Kate Raworth promotes that different way of um, conceptualizing the economy. And here you see again the the, the planetary boundaries, uh, the, the slide that I started my presentation with, the outer circle, which represents the ecological ceiling. And we've got the inner ceiling, which is kind of the needs. And here she brings together uh, yeah, the question of ecological limits uh, and human needs. Uh, and so what, what we where we would want to be as a human society is in that safe and just space. Um, and so we think it's really, yeah, it's a nice way of like showing this tension or like that mediation um, of social outcomes of ecological needs. But we, what we think is that um, actually what is needed is to fill that green space um, because neither... Uh, the so while we have some scientific uh, basis for the for the planetary boundaries, there are tipping points which we do not deny. Um, but still, like if we go for yeah, if we set uh, the target at one point five degrees or two degrees, it's a political choice that requires deliberation. Um, and the same also when it comes to human needs, we focus, we base our work uh, on the theory of human needs, where we uh, acknowledge a certain set of given basic human needs. But then the question, um, how these needs are being satisfied, these are up for deliberation. And also, yeah, the degree and uh, the the um, the the way in which need satisfaction happens is up for the deliberation. And so what we argue is that we need to plan the donut. Um, yeah, what we think is a useful way of thinking about filling the donut is to think in terms of provisioning systems, uh, which is kind of the, yeah, the material, socioeconomic dimensions um, that kind of are, have these mediating sit in the middle between planetary processes, natural resources and need satisfiers such as food, clean water, um, yeah, education uh, that then contributes to to human um, well-being, and so yeah, they link the biophysical uh, and the well-being outcomes, and so and so yeah, what we need to think about is really how to reorganize provisioning systems in a social, um, ecological way, and that's uh, part of what uh, post-growth ecological planning is about. Um, and here, I just I think I would like to show you this one first because when I just said. Uh, planning the donut. This is kind of in the um, yeah in our book chapter. We use this kind of reconceptualized donut, even if the shape has been a bit uh, undonated. Uh, but like uh, we try to conceptualize how to fill it and what the institutions um, would be. 
And so I already spoke about setting uh, priorities and limits, but then also to ensure democratic participation, to master the purposeful development of uh, the productive forces, organize and um, share meaningful work, meaningful and necessary work, and deal with social and macrofinancial disruptions. So, and so probably many more things could go, uh, could, could constitute the filling of the donut, but I will quickly, yeah, uh, walk through these four to five, just because they, to us, form the connection to the deep growth um, and post growth um, ambition. And so, yeah, so as I said, um, the first uh, bit is the setting and effectuating limits and priorities to define the types of need satisfiers that are, yeah, that are okay, that are acceptable when we want to remain within planetary boundaries, their distribution, as well as the organization of the specific um, provisioning system. Because one proposal is, for example, um, within degrowth is that of universal basic services, would, which would be like the universal provisioning um, of, of basic, uh, yeah, of basic services. Uh, and that would be a very different way of delivering, uh, of, yeah, of delivering goods and services of providing, uh, of providing for human needs. So, but yeah, there need to be yeah, the, these um, these limits and priorities, we argue, is that they need to be deliver deliberated. There need to be processes, institutions planned exactly uh, for this um, uh, for this purpose. And especially, and here we come to the second point, is that they might must be uh, decidedly planned for that purpose to ensure democratic participation, which is um, important for for different reasons, and we don't spell it out in this paper, um, like that. For example, that just the the the, the sustainable um, the sustainable support <laughs> for such um, large scale um, transformation really requires um, participation, wide participation, uh, and say um, in these processes. So this is one. Well, one argument for democratic participation, but also because degrowth has the wider ambition, um, yeah, of um, of countering uh, inequalities, of countering systems of oppression, and so when we want to tackle inequalities and disadvantages uh, in that transformation processes, then the institutions um, that are um, must be designed to exactly do that, uh, because it will not just just happen. Uh, and so here we can think of like, yeah, uh, questions of race, gender, class um, that really need to be taken into account here. And also when we think of these processes that are so far reaching, uh, what, what is required really to integrate diverse positions through participation of multiple groups and interests um, that includes experts, but not only, but it also includes different political, different geographical scales, um, yeah, and so there needs to be the way in which these processes are managed need to be, yeah, uh, democratic um, at the bottom. Um, the third point, um, which sometimes I think is a bit neglected um, in, yeah, maybe in the planning debates, but uh, you can you can correct me on that. It's really um, the question of, of, of work um, and how to actually organize uh, work and decide uh, on the sectors that are, well, I mean, that can, can links to, to the first point, already having decided maybe what priorities are in, in provisioning, but then deciding on what are the sustainable sectors, what is sustainable work, but also what is meaningful work, what is necessary work to, 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 to achieve need satisfaction. And so this kind of, then when we think about a transformation of production, of downscaling of different sectors, that is in inherently connected to changes in the world of work. And so in order to, to, to account for what is sustainable and necessary and meaningful, we need to estimate the amount and type of work that would be required to produce what is deemed socially desirable and ecologically viable. And that needs to be matched uh, with the capabilities and relative appetence of individuals, because uh, in that uh, in this participatory uh, democratic model, it's not a uh, um, it, yeah, it's not uh, to just allocate 
people to sectors and just like tell them what to do but and but then at the same time there is then attention when we think of oh this is necessary work and it needs to be done um but how to how to match that not only with skills but also in people's readiness to engage in this kind of work and so this is also where we think there must be dedicated processes uh to to manage uh these decisions um, and then also, um, and that is probably maybe, I mean, correct me again if I'm wrong, um, but I'm in the planning debates to also go beyond uh, wage labor and commodified, the com commodified spheres and commodified sectors, but also in that restructuring, in that replanning um, of the economy to also take into account uncommodified work that is done in households, very often by women, maybe very often by racialized people, um, and then also to just like see how how that can how that can be how how that can be done. Um, yeah, so these were the three um, two, uh, the three uh, the first three, <laughs> um, and the second two are uh, really to to look into the some of the technological questions. Uh, which technologies, which uh, technical models, which way of organizing uh, production and work processes are adequate uh, for social ecological provisioning um, that is also connected to ownership structures. Um, the question of yeah, what yeah, who who owns what, what kind of ownership regimes um, have we got for important societal resources? Um, and and yeah, and here we we think there are new new models, new uh, criteria for evaluation are needed. And uh, Andrea Fetter did that for technology. She's using the matrix of convivial technology and proposes different um, criteria to evaluate technology. Uh, and so here we then also move away very uh, strongly uh, from the kind of uh, technological change for labor productivity increases, for increases in output, uh, for increases in profit, but really to have, yeah, the, the question of like, how does it contribute um to to creating uh social social bonds how does it contribute to sustainability so yeah rethinking and structuring these processes um is really key and then the final um element um is really to is to deal with social and macro financial disruptions and i would probably add here um yeah, another another element, and that is ecological disruptions. Uh, and so the first, maybe on the social and macrofinancial side, um, when we think about the necessary speed and scale of a transformation proposed by degrowth or post-growth, there are risks of ruptures um, because not everything uh, can be planned and foreseen, but the, the aim would be to anticipate as much as possible uh, what uh, repercussions could be, for example, the unexpected or employment arising from the downscaling of a certain sector. Um, that needs to that needs to be factored in, that needs to be anticipated and dealt with. Um, and also the question of asset stranding. Um, yeah, when we think that um, resources that uh, yeah need to stay into the ground, what happens to financial markets? And so the really this macroeconomic coordination we think uh, is necessary and can help uh, prevent full-blown socioeconomic crisis. Um, and I'm adding the, the ecological element because also the dealing with disruptions becomes really important when we think of, yeah, the, the increase of crisis, um, uh, yeah, weather, um, extreme weather events, for example, uh, heat waves to really also, that needs to come into the planning process to anticipate uh, and cater um, for that. And so this I've already shared with you. And now maybe to the most uh, interesting uh, part for, for this community is the agenda setting framework that we put forward. Um, but yeah, for what uh, planning provisioning systems within safe and just operating space um, could look like. Um, and so, yeah, it's not 
an ideal model and it's not, I don't even know if you can call it a model. Um, and also it's more, uh, in a way it's raising more questions than answering, but what we would want to do with this model is, or this, yeah, this illustration is really to show where key challenges and points of tension are, where, it, yeah, attention also needs to go um, in the future in terms of research, but also practice. And so we see this, uh, yeah, we, we call it an agenda setting framework. Uh, that should be already available inspiration for research and practice um, and can form just the basis to discuss the specific processes, institutions and instruments, um, including technical and political questions. Um, and here we focus on three key challenges of planning beyond growth. Uh, that is multi-level dynamics, elaboration and execution. And I'll, I'll go into these uh, three, three elements. I'll just quickly check the time. OK, um, so, yeah, and this is probably probably the most uh, especially the most colorful part um, of the paper. Um, and and yeah, maybe here we just try to put together uh, these ideas uh, and conceptualize. Um, and so, yeah, we maybe we start with like the bottom right where we've got like the different autonomous entities at the local level that in, can include city councils, enterprises, but also other uh, autonomous entities, communities, um, um, yeah, whatever. Um, that's kind of, yeah, but but just when you think of uh, in terms of the kind of scale or, um, yeah, not sure hierarchy is not the the right word, big um, but yeah, the 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 really the most local um organization. We've got these different um uh agents that them whose knowledge and whose information, uh who's um yeah, um who whose visions of how to for need satisfaction, for example, need to somehow be brought together. And so these pluralistic inputs by citizens, science, industrial bodies they need to be brought together and then in the process of elaboration um yeah need to be somehow aggregated in a process of uh, deliberation and so here it's really about um yeah bringing together these pluralistic inputs uh yeah deliberate um and then bring these uh, these deliberation um yeah and subordinate and creative uh, adaptation um as a foundational rule uh, so it's really about yeah also creating um, creative um, experimentation and adaptation in that process. Um, then we've got so here we've got that level of uh, the dimension of elaboration, and then it would go to a body of uh, execution, uh, where it's really about finding the means, deciding on the means to carry out. Uh, decisions that have been made uh, in the in the elaboration in the um, in the elaboration process, and that means like yeah, pinning down certain targets, uh, for example, certain uh, yeah ecological um, visions into detail detailed targets, and here we also argue for uh, detailed uh, targets in kind. And then decide the adequate um, tools that can be investment and public orders. It can be budget programming, um, credit policies. It can be many things. But here it's also about like finding the right uh, tools that are um, adequate uh, for the specific purpose. And then it goes back to the subsectors, to other localities. Um, it goes back to uh, local, to the more local. Um, um, yeah, collective or, or institutions. And then there is experimentation um, happening. So for example, when a target is being set, it can be experimented of how at the local level it is being carried out. And then, so this is kind of where we have the, the local um, and the orange box kind of as the elaboration execution. And then we just can think of the similar processes going to the next highest level. Because um, yeah, one of the foundational principles is um, where we see is kind of um, is subsidiarity, where we think like what can be done at the local level uh, should be done at the local level, and only what needs to go higher up uh, should be dealt with higher up. And so the green um, is just like the next um, higher levels, and that way you can kind of like uh, yeah, you can you could imagine like different scales. Um, as at which uh, these um, processes happen. 
Um, and so, yeah, and so when we think uh, about it in that way, about multi-level dynamics, elaboration, execution, um, multi-level dynamics here, the challenge is that really, um, uh, yeah, a wide range of decisions uh, should, um, are not centralized, but should be made by individuals and local structures. And there need to be processes of iteration between um, distinct levels. And especially when we think, for example, about planetary boundaries that, yeah, that we set at the planetary scale, then the question is how, how can we negotiate that uh, with local communities, uh, with different regions? And so there must be, yeah, an iteration articulation uh, between different, um, between different geographical political levels. Um, as I said, what we propose is a subsidiarity principle. What can be dealt with at the lowest level should be dealt with um, at the lowest level. Um, and yeah, but these are, uh, yeah, the, so there is a top down, uh, so there's this bottom up element, but also a top down element in the sense of, well, decisions are being nurtured by the lower levels, but then they reimpose themselves on these lower levels. Um, uh, and need to and need to be um, yeah fulfilled. So in terms of okay, we set planetary boundaries. Uh, we there is a deliberation process as how these can look like. But then once they're set, they kind of reimpose themselves um, on the on local communities on on um, local actors. In terms of the elaboration, um, yeah, as I I mean I already mentioned some of these points when I was just explaining uh, the graph. It's really to have pluralistic inputs uh, to acquire the relevant information and knowledge, and then elaborate plans uh, on that basis. And that, in, uh, yeah, for for that purpose, there must be yeah a combination of representation and participation of concerned actors. It's also the question of like yeah which which form these processes actually take. Which is it. Um, these democratic deliberation, which can happen in many different ways. The question is also as to how to integrate marginalized group um, and how to account still for the, yeah, also at the same time to, to have a wide range of participation, but also include uh, experts, for example, um, competencies that uh, are needed to elaborate um, a certain plan. Um, and so we think that uh, things like climate assemblies can be very interesting here in terms of the combination uh, of citizens participation and, and expert um, participation. And we think like that the democratic quality is really important to um, yeah, to, to create legitimacy of the processes and then also ensure that uh, people and agents actually stick uh, to the plan and are okay uh, with it, uh, with its deployment, uh, with with its uh, rolling out, um, and so yeah, the final point is on, on in terms of the elaboration really must then be uh, in permanent contact with the those bodies that are um, concerned with the execution um, about the elaboration and choice of alternative um, pathways in economic, social, and um, ecological terms. Um, and and here, yeah, on the execution and on the flip side, there must be an accountability towards the elaborative uh, institution. Um, the it's yeah, it's about the oper oper operationalization of the goals that have been deliberated um, before. And yeah, and as I said, it's also about like moving away from a purely monetary. Um, assessment, but really to go into in-kind calculation uh, in terms of the targets, um, be they ecological or social, but also, yeah, in terms of um, the instruments. Um, and then the final point that then also leads me to my final um, slide is really to think about what are the adequate uh, resources, what are the adequate uh, instruments um, of the plan. And here we've got industrial policy, public orders, um, and then also we need to think about oversight and enforcement, um, um, which is also a critical point, especially when it is about creating um, a bottom up um, and local autonomy um, to the highest degree. And so then when we think of future avenues, I mean, all of these uh, challenges that I've just outlined kind of are um, yeah, are also areas of research, areas of practice that still need to be 
um explored but when we think of the current moment it's also about like so is there a real world comeback um of planning and that connects to current debates around industrial policies about price controls that we have seen in the context um yeah of the covid-19 pandemic but also now uh with the energy crisis related to the war in ukraine um to to inflation and really debates of a stronger yeah stronger government or state intervention um in my kids but the question here is really and i think there has been a lot of positive discourse oh yeah we're now talk finally talking about industrial policy again we're talking about price controls but then the question is also for which purpose and is it actually um are these are these debates kind of leading to a social ecological uh, gear towards a social ecological economy to a progressive vision or is it to maintain uh, for example competitiveness is it structured by uh, yeah geopolitical interests so i think while there is a link uh, a link and a potential it's also about yeah being clear what the what the real world uh, quality of these debates um is the same is also um yeah with endorsement for example of ecological planning in france um, and here, Cedric uh, is uh, clearly the expert, but it's interesting because there's been debates around ecological planning more on the left. Uh, but then also, uh, I think uh, Emmanuel Macron is also now talking about ecological planning. And then the question is, is this opening up a window or is it kind of yeah weakening what we understand um, as planning and therefore um yeah and therefore maybe undermining this progressive project that uh, other people have in mind and then also we need to be aware of like the increasing time pressure of the increasing yeah the increasing crisis um and disruptions that will keep happening um and that it's actually we're not planning in a void we're not planning in a um in a crisis free world but one in which it's really becoming urgent um and 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 pressures are increasing and whereas also then uh backlash um is kind of increasing on or can yeah can must at least be factored in in terms of uh progressive ideas and so uh challenges and open questions i actually started uh i actually started that slide um or like that point with challenges and open questions uh, and I think there are so many, but uh, one, and that is something that I also still have to get my head around, um, is especially when we think about that uh, transformation process is one, for example, for the role of markets um, and the price system. Uh, yeah, when we think about where we're at, we're actually basically we're starting from 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 a situation where, yeah, this is kind of the default, um, the default approach um, to economic uh, question. And then I think, yeah, I think this is sometimes where I struggle also with like kind of new models, uh, more abstract um, utopian models of economic planning, where kind of there are assumptions that we're already in a different system. And so I think it's also a question, yeah, do, for example, um, ideas around industrial policy um, allow us to shift slowly into from an from from a price a monetary uh, dominated approach to an in kind approach, for example, um, and how to yeah and is there something like a yeah a more reformist approach also to yeah to changing provisioning systems um, and 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 yeah and where does it lead us in terms of different institutions um, but yeah so these are their theoretical and practical. Uh, questions uh, that remain and yeah I thank you for your attention I really look forward to discussing all these um, issues with you